right, we're gonna get started. Um, call to order, welcome. Thank y'all for being here. We're gonna call declaration of a quorum, seven members present, one to be seated. And we're here and We'd like to welcome you to this meeting of College Station Independent School District Board of Trustees. We were elected at large to represent the interests of our community and our state in educating our students. Our mission for our students in this district is success each life, each day, each hour. We adhere to all pertinent laws, policies and procedures in posting agendas and conducting our meetings. The detailed agenda information was made available to us at least 72 hours in advance, and we have all come to this meeting informed and prepared. We have just completed a workshop meeting where we heard reports and discussed much of the information needed to make decisions in either this meeting or in an upcoming meeting. This is a meeting of the seven trustees in a public setting, setting rather than a public meeting. As such, public comment is included on the agenda at a specific time and requires us to listen rather than take action so as to abide by the Open Meetings Act. We are pleased that you have taken the time this evening to join us. We are very proud of this school district and we thank you for your interest in and support of our students. That takes us to item C, recognitions, item C1, Mr. Martindale. Thank you, Mr. Horak. Just an observation, if I can get this fixed, but I have noticed your new president and you really take authority with the gavel. So I just wanted to, to mention- And you are welcome. <laughs> You're very good. So, yeah. all right, uh, students to help us with our pledges and our moment of silence this evening, uh, come to us from Cypress Grove Intermediate and College Station Middle School. I would ask those students and their principals, Ms. Cameron from Cypress Grove and Mr. Headnot from CSMS uh, to come forward. And, and I'll, I'll look at the principals. I don't know if the students are going to introduce themselves or the, the students are going to handle their introductions and then assist us with our pledge and moment of silence. So, very good. And we'll start with those folks. Tonight I have with us, oh, let me uh, give a shout out to Mr. Horak and Mr. Martindale and the board. Tonight I bring to you two fabulous students from College Station Middle School from Night Nation. I'm Keaton Johnson, play football, and on my off time I play basketball and baseball. I'm Ariana Taylor, and on my off time I run track. All right, from Cypress Grove I have campus leaders Miles Simpson and Nora Nolan. My name is Miles Simpson. I'm in sixth grade at Cypress Grove. I enjoy baseball in my free time and love band at Cypress Grove. When I graduate, my goal is to go to Vanderbilt to play baseball. I'm Nora Nolan, and I'm in sixth grade at Cypress Grove. I enjoy mountain biking and playing soccer in my free time, and I love all the staff at CG. When I graduate, my goal is to do something to help animals. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for the Texas Pledge. I honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Please remain standing and join me in a moment of silence. Thank you, you may be seated. You don't get off that easy. I'm back up for pictures. Thank 
Mr. Horak, that moves us to item C2, uh, C2 student staff recognitions. We have uh, two sets of recognitions tonight. Mr. Glenwick is going to assist us. The first of which are our FFA national champion meet team, judging team, uh, and staff and students. As Mr. Glenwick will call your name, if you'll come forward, you'll get your certificate from me on the far side and please shake hands uh, with board members. Mr. Glenwinkle. Thank you, Mr. Martindale. Uh, Mr. Horak and members of the board, it is my distinct pleasure to be here this evening to recognize some students for their outstanding work and extracurricular activities. And first, we're going to start with a meet judging national championship team. The College Station High School FFA meet judging team won the meets evaluation national championship at the 94th National FFA Convention and Expo in Indianapolis. The team, representing Texas by virtue of winning the state title last spring, outjudged 41 other state champion teams from all across the United States in a competitive event that tests students' skills and competencies in evaluating and identifying meat carcasses and products. All four members of the CSHS team placed in the top 10 individually in the national competition. So I call your name, please come forward to be recognized. 10th high individual in the nation, Carly Kazi. Eighth high individual in the nation, Hayden Bennett. The fourth high individual nationally, Caitlin Catrola. And placing second in the nation, uh, also uh, this gentleman placed fifth in the National Agri-Science Fair competition as well. So fifth in the nation, or second in the nation, uh, individually in meat judging, fifth in the nation in the Agri-Science Fair, Nathan Kurt. And finally, the teacher uh, slash coach of this group, Miss Erin Stutz. All right, now for our second group of honorees tonight. Both College Station, Station ISD marching bands placed in the top three at the area competition to advance to the 5A state marching band contest. The College Station High School Cougar Band placed second, while the A&M Consolidated High School Tiger Band placed third out of the 13 competing, competing vans, bands. This was a historic accomplishment in that it was the first trip ever to the state contest for both schools. Our marching bands consist of many more people than the band leadership who are being recognized tonight. However, we would like to congratulate all the members of the Tiger and Cougar bands. When I call your name, please come forward to be recognized. Uh, from AMCHS, a drum major, Amira Barrera.
CSHS drum major, Skylar Ford. AMCHS drum major, Madison Jackson. <laughs> CSHS drum major, Holly Colby. CSHS drum major, Jack Montgomery. <laughs> AMCHS drum major, Emily Reed. CSHS drum major, Catherine Renard. AMCHS drum major, Faith Wink. Leading these large group of marching students, uh, the AMCHS band director is Mr. Steve Fry. The assistant band director at AMCHS, Andrew Parham. Director at College Station High School, Mr. John Seal. And Assistant Director, Mr. Michael Dixon. I believe both those gentlemen are at a convention uh, at this point, so you guys wanna. Mr. Horrock, Mr. Martinell, that concludes our recognitions for this evening. That's going to bring us to item C3. Uh, make sure if you get a chance, you get to check out all the artwork there at the back of our boardroom here from Riverbend Elementary College Station Middle School uh, student designed holiday cards selected by different district departments. So wonderful job and uh, talented students we have possibly working for Hallmark down the road. So we'll see where we're at. Uh, that brings us to item D. Consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are item G, J5, J6, J7, J8. Any discussion, questions, anything 
need a remove. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes for the consent agenda, 7-0. And moving on to item E, board, E1, Mr. Martindale. Oh, we'll probably take the opportunity for any uh, particular board reports and then I can uh, close this uh, agenda item with superintendent update. I can go. I today get to um, report for Head Start um, and also, can you all hear me? And also for um, Education Foundation. So let's start with Head Start. Um, we met today and um, the budget was presented and voted on and approved. Um, also, we are, at, or we are at capacity with our Head Start and Early Head Start. Um, Oh, they talked about the holiday extravaganza. I think that was actually this morning. There was some sing-alongs, and um, the, it sounded like the parents had a really good time at that. Also, a field trip to the fire station was a highlight for some of the for some of the kiddos, um, and I love hearing about all that because you know we learn through field trips. Um, also, the most important thing I think is that um, Shelley Rice was approved as interim director. So. That's all I have for, yes, yay. And then for Education Foundation, I get to just tell you guys about all kinds of good stuff that was, that's going on with that. With that. Um, this last Saturday, we had Chrissy's Closet Christmas Edition, and there were 368 visitors of those, well, I didn't write down how many were students. It was 200 and something of those were students, 247. Yes, thank you. And um, we had 47 volunteers, community volunteers, help out with that. Um, Santa was there to take pictures with kiddos. Um, there were cookie kits that were given away. And um, the kids got to pick out presents to give to their parents, which I think is just, I think that's very special. Also, um, $15,000 was given to school food pantries from Education Foundation. I believe that was a grant that was um, that Education Foundation applied for and they got that. So they were able to give 15,000 to our school food pantries. And also on Saturday was uh, last month, you know, I talked about the mattresses, about the Sweet Dreams project. Um, it was fully funded by our community and our board members. So they were able to give away 100 mattresses this last weekend, you guys, to some very deserving kiddos, and they got the mattress, the mattress pad cover, sheets, pillows, blankets, and a book. So I got to see some pictures and um, looked like there were some very happy kiddos. So to everyone involved with that, thank you. And that is all I have. Thank you. Uh, DEIC met Wednesday, December 8th and in person here and the majority was to go from three suggested schedules to do to put it out to public to review and then it'll be brought to the board once comment is given uh, and then audit met today and great there are no findings and we'll hear that all together later on this evening and i've got a couple um PAC met on December 7th. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to, to attend, um, but they do a fabulous job with their minutes. They really do, so kudos to them. A lot of good detail there. Um, I would say one of the, the fun things that they talked about they'll be kicking off soon is one of the roles of the PAC committee is to do the employee awards for the year, so they'll be kicking that off in, in January, the, they go through the recommendations and the voting and such for those for those awards. Um, I was um, Shaq is um, meeting in committees right now. I think I pointed that out last time that we've broken into two committees. One that's going to be um, addressing the health curriculum changes and our and rural recommendations, and then the other just the health and wellness plan. So splitting that out with another committee. So they have. Those committees have met and they will continue to do so in the spring before they bring recommendations to the board in probably April. And then 
We'll get much more detail a little bit later from Ms. Parkerson on the Academic Achievement and Class Rank Committee. They are also keeping very busy, had two meetings since our last board meeting, um, and really continue to make good, meaningful, methodical process. I mean, I just just want to say just not only is it is it managed well in there, but I, I truly believe that just the taking the time and the discussions that we've had are really helping the group come to better decisions. I mean, that's that's what we're, why we're doing it that way, and I think it really is working. So um, thanks to not only Ms. Parkerson for doing that, but also really everybody who keeps showing up for those for those meetings, including our, our community representatives, but also our faculty and you know the staff that you know come after their work days to do those as well. There we go. Can I just add, add one thing about the, the, the PAC meeting? Because it's a, it's a topic that we've discussed as a, as a board over time. But uh, <clears throat> Dr. Dixon gave a, a, a great kind of overview of the, the mental health uh, resources that um, employees and staff in the district have. Um, and so I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for doing that because it, it is a it's, it's a topic that's been before the board several times, and um, to get that out there so, so more folks know about it is, is, is great. So thank you. Good. Uh, for superintendent's update, just uh, at the November meeting, I mentioned that Commissioner uh, Morath was visiting the district on December 1st. He did come visit. In fact, he visited uh, Miss Cotton Forest Ridge. So I just want to pass along my thanks to her and her staff for hosting Commissioner Morath. He got to uh, experience a, a literacy lesson as well as join in uh, a professional uh, learning conversation. So they did a wonderful job. And again, we're uh, flattered that Commissioner Morath picked College Station ISD to, uh, to come visit uh, on its way to the service center. Also, we were originally scheduled, I think I mentioned this at the November meeting as well, we have uh, an exploratory team really of administrators and stakeholders coming from Lake Travis ISD. Uh, they are in the process of looking at various options, their high school currently, uh, their growth, uh, looking at a couple of different avenues, whether a ninth grade center expanding their existing high school or exploring a second comprehensive high school. They were scheduled to uh, be in district on Thursday. They're going to push that to after the holiday, but we're excited to, to host those folks. They want to come see uh, Hackensaw and CSHS do business. Um, it's no secret that we have two uh, of the finest comprehensive high schools in the state of Texas. So we look forward to, to hosting uh, our colleagues from Lake Travis after the holiday. Uh, I'll mention this as well. Later this evening, of course, uh, our appreciation to our community for uh, passing uh, three of the four bonds on November 2nd. Uh, later this evening, we'll hear from our financial advisor as well as our bond council uh, so we can take action and start moving forward with that process. But I want to mention to the board uh, and everyone else that through the course of the spring, we'll begin seeing purchases associated with those bond funds, uh, whether uh, buses, technology, uh, fine arts materials, those types of things will begin to occur through the course of the spring. And some of our initial renovation pieces will begin as early Early is this next summer and will extend over probably three to four summers to get all of those uh, items completed. Um, also earlier at workshop, and again, uh, the board is aware, but just for the collective group and the visitors here we have this evening, we had significant conversation around employee health care. Uh, we'll be uh, looking forward to taking some action on um, possibly opting out in TRS active care. We feel like we have a, a very strong option uh, in place uh, and considering that opting out that would serve our employees extremely well in an effort to try to mitigate increased uh, rising insurance uh, premiums that we've experienced through the course of the last several years. Also, we heard from Templeton De Demographics uh, with our 10-year projection update and later in the board meeting, Ms. Straws will uh, take a, a deeper dive into that. Uh, there will be just a handful of small recommendations coming out of that particular report. And as uh, Ms. McAdams alluded to, Ms. Parkinson will give us a detailed uh, debriefing of the work of our, 
our, our policy EIC, uh, our academic achievement uh, committee and their work around um, that policy and grade points. Uh, also, we will be uh, posting our two calendar options coming out of DEIC. That will be posted uh, to begin to gather public input tomorrow. That's correct, Mr. Uh, Glenwick, I apologize. Tomorrow, it will remain up through uh, the beginning of the new year into the first week of January for folks to provide us that feedback. Close on just a couple of student celebrations. Of course, we had some earlier with our national championship meets judging team, national champions, guys. So, uh, and, and of course, our two bands going the state are um, from Consol and CSHS, first time in school history. But we had three FFA teams advance the state leadership uh, competition of uh, the last week or so. We've had uh, five uh, different students named All State Orchestra. Choir and band auditions for All State are occurring now. Uh, our Consol tennis team did at the regional tournament this fall. They were recognized and achieved the team sportsmanship award. So kudos to that group. And uh, I, I heard a little bit of this news, but I think there's a football game Friday night in Arlington. So um, just um, it, we, we have the opportunity to celebrate our student success each month and they hear these things and, and that's wonderful. And I think we just need to make sure that we recognize uh, the exceptional work of our, our, our teachers and our faculty and staff and our sponsors and directors and the uh, outstanding performance of our students. Uh, it's all those things that make our district special. So that closes the superintendent update, Mr. Horak. All right, a lot going on, a lot of successes. That's a plus all day. Uh, brings us to item F, hearing of citizens. Ms. Horn, nothing, okay. We move to item H1, consideration, discussion, and possible action regarding an annual review of HB3 board goals. Mr. Martindale. Thank you, Mr. Warwick and board members. Uh, the board is required through House Bill 3 to, to adopt some student performance goals. We have to review those on an annual basis. Here with uh, that information and, and also some suggested, suggested uh, language tweaking to those goals is our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Penny Trammell. Dr. Trammell. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Horak, board. Um, it is the time, according to our timeline for monitoring board goals, to receive an annual report. So uh, with that, we will get started. With House Bill 3, um, we were required to write board goals across the state, and boards were required to adopt those goals, and we are also required to progress monitor those goals. The reason we have these goals is to support the state's 60 by 30 goal of establishing a pre-K through 12th grade goal of at least 60% proficiency at TEA's meets standard at two key checkpoints on the state's public pre-K through 12th grade continuum. When we look at those two checkpoints, one is that 60% of all students will meet the state's standard at third grade reading. The second checkpoint is that 60% of all high school seniors graduating without the need for remediation and achieving one of three things, an industry-based uh, certificate that would uh, provide them with a way to earn a living or a wage, be a wage earner. Um, two would be to enroll in a post-secondary education program of their choice. And three would be to enroll in the military. So the state really wants at least 60% of all students to graduate with one of these three opportunities. And in order to do that, um, we know the research supports reading at third grade as a predictor of success, so that is why they established that third grade goal as well. So um, House Bill 3 required boards to establish local goals and then to annually report goal progress publicly. Now, we report individual school progress to you in the transmittal, and so um, we have two board goals. One is really... Um, 
or one is the 60% and we've done reading and math. And then uh, one is the CCMR, the Career College Military Ready Goal. So um, with that, we are going to report tonight on those district goals. And then um, we're going to give you a peek at our fall progress monitoring measures. So to get started, we are going to look at STAR reading. And as we look at this, um, just a reminder that the students did not test in the spring of the pandemic uh, that where we stayed at home uh, for safety reasons. And I also want to remind you that last year, Many of our students were still in virtual learning. Um, many came back at semester, but some did not. Some stayed home the entire year and the state required them if they chose to come and take the STAR test on campus. So um, we gave a preliminary report on this in July. We didn't have our final results. There were a couple of little tweaks when we received our final report card and this slide reflects those tweaks. So um, overall, we scored um, at 56% of our third grade students meeting the expectation for the state. Now, with that, I do want to remind everyone that um, in, you know, CSISD's overall performance um, in 2019 was 51%. And we increased during a pandemic from 51% to 56%. So just to, to note that, and many districts across the state uh, declined in their performance, including the state overall, which went from 44% in 2019 down to 38%. So I think that speaks to our parents and our kids and our, our teachers and the hard work of our uh, administrators. If you look across the bottom row, you will notice that um, some things are shaded in yellow and some things are shaded in green. We know that we set five-year goals for improvement and um, the way this slide is organized is you'll see the um, 2021 end of your goal as um, you know 17.5%, 42.5%, etc. The green indicates we met or exceeded that goal, and the yellow means we came close, but we did not meet the goal. So as you can see, uh, as you look across the bottom row quickly, uh, we really did exceed our goal in many areas with many of our groups of students, and we came very close with others. So um, I think that's... Uh, a celebration in and of itself and I know Miss Perry gave a report that reflected our performances but this is just kind of a, a different way to look at it when we look at it compared to third grade. There are three progress monitoring measures that go with each goal. We elected to do the circle test at pre-k, kindergarten monitoring with MAP, and a collective average of first through third grade performance. So this information kind of tells us, are we on track or how much work do we have to do? Where are kids in their current levels of performance? Which it helps us greatly in monitoring uh, and adjusting instruction and um, just designing those individualized uh, programs and tutoring to help in each group of students grow. So as we look at our circle data for the beginning of this year, the goal is the second to the last line. And you'll notice um, the goal across here. And again, we've highlighted just for your information where we are with our beginning of year assessments. So, oops, I, I switched slides, sorry. You can see that at the pre-K level, we have some work to do, but we feel confident that our teachers are going to be able to provide the experiential learning, the play-based learning, and the language experiences that students need to increase and meet our goals this year. So, Penny, on this slide, mm -hmm. we have our end-of-year goal, which is articulated at, at the top, and then, mm -hmm. of course, uh, across the grid for each uh, student group. 
the data we have currently is for beginning of year. Correct. Okay. So um, we have finished our beginning of year assessments. We haven't quite finished our middle of the year assessments, or I would report that most current data to you. Um, if you look across the top, that is the, the plan through 2024. The top line is our target. The bottom line is our actual performance. 64.5% um, last year uh, in 2020 when we had many of our young learners at home and we know they learn best with um, collaborating and talking to one another and uh, a high level of experiential learning. Um, so the 2021-22 number you see that with the word, it looks like boy, but it stands for b beginning of year assessments. So um, is 50%. So we do have 22.5% to grow to meet our goal. Um, you know, these, these students haven't been to school before. And so um, we usually see great gains in their learning. And just to clarify, the three rows down here are yes. all end of year data, except, so then, except for the final one. The which two is the rows, okay. the two rows, um, thank you for that question. The two rows are end of year data. 20, uh, the starting percentage that we used from 2018 for the 2019 data because we didn't take end of year on that particular year. And then um, the 2021-22 yes, end of year goal, goal right. is, is the third line down. Mm -hmm. So 2021 end of year is up there just for your reference. Does that make sense? Yes. It, it's where we're shooting to be by the end of the year, but the data that you're looking at is from obviously the beginning of your administration. Makes a and with the younger confusing. learners that haven't been in school before, there's significant increase through the course of the year with it being right. their initial school experience. Right. So, um, yeah, I did leave that end of your data in there for you all. Um, and if that's confusing, I can absolutely take it out next time that we look at these so that you're not looking at the goals and the actual data from uh, prior years. So as we look at our first, uh, our second progress monitoring measure for reading, we are looking at kindergarten performance. And again, as uh, Mr. Martindale indicated, across you will see where we ended the year um, in 2020. Our goal was 58% and we ended in at 53%, which again, it was a pandemic year, so um, we came close. And then this year, our goal is 58.5%. And we are already at 66%. So we have already exceeded our goal in kindergarten um, at this point in the year. So kudos to our kids, right, and teachers. Um, if we look across the bottom, we will see the 21-22 end of year goal markers. And then you will see highlighted in green where we have already exceeded those goals and uh, where we still have the opportunity to grow. Um, you know, it could, our, we want every child to be successful. So it's great that we are exceeding them in many, with many of our groups and with our overall score as well. When we look at first through third grade, uh, the same thing. The beginning of year score for first through third grade was 50.5% overall. Our goal this year is 44.5, so we have exceeded that goal. Again, if you look at the bottom, you'll see our 2021-22 goal, and then you'll see our beginning of year performance uh, and where we are. Again, um, we are exceeding expectations, and we almost made it um, with this group right here, but I didn't, you know, if I rounded up, it was 73, and so I thought, well, I'll let you see the specifics there. As we look at the third grade students who meet expectations or met expectations on STAR math, this is where we ended up. We ended up at 54% and um, the goal was 59.5%. So we were, we were close and um, our kids and teachers worked very hard to get there. If we look across the bottom row, you'll notice where our goal markers are for 
um, were for the 2021 school year. And remember, STAR is a little bit different in that you call the 2021 school year 2021 STAR. So um, these were our benchmarks that we hope to meet. And these were uh, the scores that we achieved it with each group in those marks. Let you look at that for a second. Penny, third grade um, star math performance last year collectively at the state level went up or down? Um, I believe it went down. It went down. And these students would be uh, that tested would have been uh, virtual through the course of last year or in person, a combination mm -hmm. thereof, correct? That is correct. Okay. That is correct. So, as we look at our math uh, progress monitoring measures for this year, we will notice that our beginning of year score was um, our students achieved at the 73rd percentile or 73% and our goal was 69.5%. So again, we have exceeded our goal. If we look across the bottom at our individual uh, goal marker for the 21-22 school year, and this would be we want to achieve this by the end of the year, um, you again can look across at the highlights and see how we are doing at this point. So um, our teachers, everyone's doing a great job so far. And uh, no doubt we will continue to grow uh, with our middle of year data. Okay, got that. Um, as we look at our kindergarten progress monitoring uh, data, our goal was 53.5%. Uh, we achieved 67.5%. So um, it's just making a huge difference to have all of our kids in school and um, you know, taking advantage of the great work our teachers do. Our end of year goals are here. And this was actually our beginning of year data. So that's pretty impressive. Um, with our first through third grade measure, we um, had a goal of 53.5%. We achieved 54.7%. And then again, you can see across the bottom where we kind of, you know, uh, performed as in relation to our end of year goals. Now, uh, uh, CCMR is also um, an area that we monitor. And um, in 2021, our students, uh, the, the, the goal we had for our students was 72.5%. However, we scored 66% overall. And you might be going, why is that, right? And if you look down at the bottom, you'll see some, some yellow as opposed to or compared to the goal that we wanted to achieve. And um, there, there was a significant reason for this besides the pandemic. Our SAT and ACT data weigh greatly on this career college military ready goal. And um, we did not have uh, as, as many students uh, choose to test last year um, with the work that Mr. Ross is doing and, um, you know, having a normal year, we anticipate that this will grow greatly in our next um, STAR report. So. Dr. Hamill, question, was that, do you think, because more universities were not requiring it? Do we know why you of them were testing? You know, um, attendance was down overall. Um, students were at home, but they weren't logging in, uh, less so in our district than across the state. But um, it, it, that may have been a factor. But it, 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 regardless, um, if the universities intended that or not, it did affect local school districts rating in this area. So um, I want to stop there and say, are there any other questions about our uh, progress toward our goals, and then um, our end of year annual report on our district goals.
I have a different question. Um, sure. So is this the first year that we will have, hopefully, have three um, three times that they will have the MAP test? Is this our first year to fully do the MAP test, beginning of year, middle of year, and end of year? So we fully did the MAP test last year. However, but we had many students, you know. Right. Right. Yes. Virtual. Yes. So yes. I should have so, I should have qualified it at the beginning of this question. And this is our first year with in person correct. to have three administrations. That's the word I was looking for. Absolutely. Administrations of the MAP test. Thank you, Ms. Nolan. Absolutely. Okay. It is our first year. Okay. With everyone in school to have the MAP test. Okay. Then I'm interested to see what how that's going to help our star scores this year. Yeah, so two years ago when we initiated we didn't have end of year because right. March that was when it. all this started, mm -hmm. right? So we didn't capture in the year. Last year, because we had the virtual component in it as well, that it impacts that data mm -hmm. point. So right. and we continue to track right. where we are now with things and society as a whole through the course of the end of the school year. It would be the, yes, the first full nine months in person that we were able to administer beginning, middle, and end. Okay. So it, it will be very interesting. I agree. Mm -hmm. See exactly what the data looks like. Mm -hmm. Then we'll be able to really probably dig down into virtual versus in person, the mm -hmm. impact of actually being in school a whole right. year or missing a year or being virtual for a year. And then there'll be lots of different ways you'll be able to dissect some of that performance. Right. And I think with uh, some of the the younger uh, kiddos in beginning of year and being in person and starting the school year in person and those types of things, I think that's why you're seeing some of that initial data exceeding their original goal. Um, the 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 just the, the presence in the classroom with the teacher uh, there, there's you just can't you cannot mimic that quality from a virtual standpoint you just simply can't right right, right. And just having this this amazing I mean I, I think that the map testing is this really cool tool that the teachers get all kinds of feedback um, in different areas and they know exactly where to help kid where to help kids um, so I'm interested to see where this what we learn from all of this yeah. thank you uh-huh if there are no further questions, uh, we will move on. So um, we adopted MAP um, over three years ago. And, um, you know, as we have grown in our understanding of the different reports and as they have added reports, um, we would like to request um, a revision in the wording and the way we are writing our progress monitoring goals. So currently, our uh, goal states the percent of K kindergarten students that score 50th percentile or above in MAP growth reading will increase from 58% to 62% by June 2024. Um, the proposed new language would be more of a growth measure. The percent of kindergarten students that met or exceeded their MAP growth goal on MAP reading will increase from 58% to 62% by June 2024. So, um, and then the same thing with uh, first through third grade. So um, that 50th percentile, we, we wrote this on a percentile score that is normed nationally. And what we would like to do is make our goal more about individual student growth because we know that if they are meeting their individual growth targets, um, they're going to be on grade level or higher. So um, this would help us uh, in our re reporting to the board in that um, it wouldn't be, uh, it would be more about growth as opposed to um, a percentile ranking nationally. So I'll let you think about that for a second. Um, as uh, you know, we also hired a, uh, the, a director of assessment. And so um, as we looked at our data and uh, worked on just the different reporting the ways we could report, 
um, this was a recommendation to make it more about individual student growth. And if um, each student is meeting or exceeding their MAP uh, growth goal, then they are going to be successful. So I don't know if you have any questions about that. I may have to call uh, Molly up here on a 911 call if you have too complex of questions. Let, let me ask, try to ask my question or my, my thoughts on that, make sure I understand, because um, I, just, I think the benefits of looking at growth is because we, we do want growth on every child, even the even the students that are already meeting standards, right? We can we can start to see we see growth on every student. I, I just want to, uh, not knowing exactly how the MAP growth goals are set mm -hmm. for students, is it always true that a growth goal uh, for a student who's not meeting standard, that the goal would be at a level that would get them to a meet standard, or would the goal just be an, some meaningful growth for that student? That's what, I mean, that could be different, right? It could just mean they could be making a meaningful step for them as opposed to does that necessarily mean they're making a step all the way to a, a meet standard. I want to make sure we don't... <coughs> lower our standards? Yeah, or, or miss... Yeah. ...understanding getting to the, to the, to the standards for every child, for every student. Mm -hmm. that we're, mm -hmm. um, and Molly, correct me if I answer this incorrectly, Miss former assessment person. Um, it is my understanding that um, the, the, the bar for MAP is a, a norm referenced bar. So that would not change. It, they would still be normed, but what this would um, allow us to do is look at each individual's growth to, um, I guess, better know um, what we need to to do in order to um, help them. We have a report that I think um, you all would appreciate, and um, it is a growth report. And so the report says, are our students growing at, at the rate that they should, and um, it's got a, a visual bar graph with the the growth diamond on it to let you know here's where they are, but here's where they're supposed to be. So it gives you more of a comparative look at um, where our students are as opposed to just a percentage. So uh, you get, uh, I guess I, I feel like you would get more valuable information on the effectiveness of how our students are growing. Molly, you provide some clarity on that yes. question, please. Thank you. I may have answered that incorrectly. Absolutely. So MAP is a nationally normed standardized assessment, as Dr. Trammell has shared, uh, that is administered to hundreds of thousands of students across the nation. In that process of national norming, the 50th percentile falls at the very center of average. So if you can visualize that bell curve where half of the students are falling above, half of the students are falling below, we can look at this through two lenses. One would be achievement. Where do students fall relative to their peers in terms of uh, the the questions that they have been able to answer correctly. Then we also look at where they have grown from, from a baseline. In our case, we typically look beginning of year to end of year, each year, and then can develop a trend line over time. So when we're talking about growth in the MAP assessment relative to the new language in board goals, we're suggesting a shift from that, have they met the bar, to are they growing enough in order to begin to close that gap? And you're right, Ms. McAdams, if you grow one year, and you're three years behind, you're never going right. to catch up. And so the way that the assessment is actually designed is that those growth goals are customized based on the student's prior performance. And so a student is going to have to have a, a more accelerated level of growth to meet their goal if they are already behind their peers. Okay. Yeah, that, that part is kind of what I was getting at, you know, to, to make sure. I mean, going back to our you know, to these goal, goal two, are we really being able to see the growth for some of the, the underperforming students, you know, that, that make sure that that is captured in this way that we're looking at growth. So I think I feel better with, thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, you both. So, but 
so by changing the definition, we're, we're not making more green boxes on the report. No. We're able to better or more accurately address resources and efforts by um, change, as opposed to the, the 65 percent percentile. Correct, definition. because it, it's a moving kind of target, so to speak, with a bell curve. So um, this um, I worked with uh, Ms. Hendricks on this. Uh, and she she's out right now, but Molly can um, help if I misspeak. But um, we feel like this will be beneficial to our students um, and our teachers. It's truly about growth. And it's still going to help us correlate these monitor progress monitoring towards the HB3 goals, Correct. right? And this yeah, is a norm maybe. reference. Right. Um, assessment so okay so with that um, we would like to ask permission or for the board to uh, change the progress monitoring language on the house bill three goals and plans to read as presented in order to be about individual student growth um, so it is recommended that the proposed updates uh, to the language related to progress monitoring of the House Bill 3 goals are adopted as presented. And I'll just go back so you can see that again. We are still maintaining the bar of meeting or exceeding. So we are not lowering the standard or changing the standard uh, in any way. I move to accept the proposed new language for the HB3 goals as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Motion passes. Thank you, Dr. Trim. Thank you. All right, that'll bring us to item H2, consideration and discussion regarding the work of the Academic Achievement and Class Rank Committee relating to board policy EIC local. Mr. Martindale. Thank you, Mr. Horak. Uh, with an update on uh, the committee's work with EIC local is our Executive Director of Secondary Education, Ms. Tiffany Parkerson. Good evening, Mr. Martindale, Mr. Horak, and, and the board. Um, this is an informational item this evening to update you all regarding the progress that we have made on our academic achievement in class rank committee, which is really taking a close look at policy EIC local, which once again um, in the colloquial vernacular is the GPA policy. So our purpose is to really examine that policy closely and then as a committee determine whether any changes need to be recommended for consideration um, by you all. And so at this point, um, the consensus of the committee is that we would like to really examine um, looking at some of those changes and I'll tell you more about that as we proceed through this update. I'd also like to remind the group that any changes that would be made by the work of this committee would be for a designated incoming freshman class. Therefore, it will not affect anyone who is currently in high school. You can see um, that, that we began this work in September and at this point have had uh, six meetings in person and um, one opportunity for online feedback. Um, we had that, um, we had to make that trip to San Antonio to support our two bands and so that, that adjusted our schedule uh, slightly as well. So we have really, um, taking care to make sure that all members of the committee have the same schema, the same background knowledge, the same understanding before moving forward into looking at whether we wanted to make any changes. So we spent a lot of time really reviewing our policy as well as seeing how that um, comes into play for, for actual students, looking at calculating sample GPAs um, based on our current policy. And then taking a look at 20 comparison school districts and their policies. Um, we also heard from an admissions counselor from Texas A&M to give us a little bit more background information about how uh, this, this affects our students in the long term. And we've had a lot of conversation as well around how this policy comes into play and affects our students in, in scholarships and things like that as well. Well. So we um, began really delving into the, the realm of potentially 
taking a look at revising the policy mid-November. Um, and as Mrs. McAdams alluded to earlier tonight, um, it, it's slow and steady work. Um, it is meaningful work. And I will attempt this evening to capture some of that conversation in the room so you can um, get a little bit more background knowledge yourselves as to why we are uh, heading in the direction that we are. Um, I also told you last month that we know that our, our original intention to be finished at this board meeting um, we would not make that cut off. And so at this point, we have scheduled two more meetings in January um, with the, the full acknowledgement that if we are not in a place where we as a committee feel ready to bring forward a recommendation to you, we will continue that work to make sure that we get it right. So just a, a reminder of the overview, we, um, based on the committee's feedback, decided to, to start in the middle of the order. So with that third section there, weighted the weighted grading system, it is the most complex portion. Um, and once we are able to come to some decisions there, um, then I believe we'll move more quickly into uh, the the beginning, a consistent application for graduating class in the calculation section, and finally um, close out our work with looking at the final section of the document, the local graduation honors. Through our process, um, you know, we are working toward that consensus, a general agreement. Um, we want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and confident that we are making the, the best choices possible. We, possible that we can for our kids in align, in alignment with our strategic strategic design work as well. Um, this starts by a lot of time for individual reflection to make sure that each committee member really um, establishes their own mindset and their own ideas before moving into the, the, the discussion. Um, then we have six large table teams working and then they cross team with one another um, to further reach consensus. We're really focusing on concepts, broad concepts, not wordsmithing, um, which is hard for some of us in the room, all those English teachers. Um, but we really are thinking about the ideas and we'll work on the, the wording as we, we get there. Um, and certainly we do have some constraints. Um, certainly grades are a thing. We will continue to have them. Those types of things we must consider. Um, we're not throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater to go with that. Um, metaphor as well. So we need to make sure we're staying within the lines, but doing the best that we can for our kids as we make these um, recommendations. So that first decision point there, um, within the weighting grading, grading system, we have two decision points. Decision one really was about the tiers um, that we will include in the policy. Our current policy is that we have uh, two tiers of weights, uh, eligible AP courses and other locally designated advanced courses, and then everything else is tier two. The committee has reached consensus in this area on moving from a two-tiered system to a three-tiered system. That top tier would be the advanced placement courses. The second tier would be those locally designated advanced courses. And right now, the committee has determined um, that we feel like the best place for dual credit to fall in those tiers uh, would be in tier two. Um, please note that it, it says tentatively, this is one of those places that we agreed to place it here to be able to move forward. But once we are further into the process and have a draft document to look at, we may revisit where dual credit falls. Um, our current system does not include dual credit courses in our GPA system. So that is an addition. Um, then all other courses would fit into that third tier of courses as well. You know, I shared that this weighted grading system is the most complex. Um, so we have a second decision in this area, and that is regarding our conversion chart. And so you see a snippet here on this page of our current um, conversions for our weighted grading um, grade point averages. So we are still in progress, but we have made we have made progress here. We just have not finalized um, our recommendation in this area yet. Um, there is consensus on the committee regarding two things. First of all, um, in our current system, you'll notice and that the top right hand um, circle there there had to have an arrow. Okay, um, that. For tier two courses, so these would be all unweighted courses, a 3.0 um, equates to a 90. Through our analysis and looking at comparison school districts and just our own backgrounds as to how colleges calculate GPA, um, 
the perception is that, that a three O is a B in, in most people's eyes. And so we want to make sure that we are doing something to rectify that so that our students are not inadvertently disadvantaged um, in our unweighted GPA. We also, um, as a, a committee, have come to consensus on making sure that in this area of our conversion chart that we um, do not duplicate the the concern that, that has been brought forward here. Um, at this time, students who earn 70s in courses get the course credit. And so if a student is taking a tier one course, um, which right now for us is an, an AP or an advanced class, if they don't make a 75, then they do not get that benefit in their grade point average. Um, they get course credit, but they don't get the, the GPA weight. And so the committee would like to extend that advanced course weighting down to the 70 at the point at which they will get their credits, okay? So those are two pretty big philosophical items um, that we've reached consensus on. We've also reached some general consensus about um, looking at having a three-tiered system at which we are at 6.0 for our tier one courses, 5.5 for our tier two courses, and 5.0 for our tier three courses. Um, there's been a lot of conversation in the room about making sure that we don't have such a huge differential between the three tiers that we inadvertently disincentivize kids to take classes that are at the appropriate level of rigor for them in tier two, right? Um, May so, I, yes, ma'am. I also like that there's not such a huge gap between mm -hmm. the tier one and the tier three. I really appreciate that. You know, whenever I was um, going back through and, and typing up this example, um, the, the patterns make sense to me, if you will, um, of the conversion. You know, when we're looking at what a 90 means here um, in an on-level course or, or um, let me explain also, there are some circumstances where we do need to provide a student an unweighted GPA based on our scale. The total unweighted GPA is tier three, right? So it makes sense for that unweighted 4.0 to be the 90 um, to the benefit of students as well. Um, and so this does, meets the purpose here in um, the first decision of getting that unweighted GPA um, to the 90. And then you'll also notice in this example that um, we have extended the benefit of the advanced coursework the whole way down through the 70 for those students taking those courses and choosing to accept that challenge. So at this point, um, this is very much a draft that we will take back to the committee. I want to be clear on that. Um, they have not come to total consensus on this because we have a lot of additional conversation going on around this um, as far as what needs to be included on student student transcripts. So at this time for us, we include um, our weighted GPA. There are other school districts who include additional information um, and there are circumstances where that is useful to students. And so we will continue this um, portion of the conversation when we reconvene after the holiday break um, about whether numerical averages and a converted GPA need to be included um, or, or is it an and or an or, um, as well as including both unweighted and weighted GPAs. And so when you think about uh, the, the average person who is not schooled in um, GPA calculation, that numerical number is really important. Like I understand when my child has a 98 or I understand when my child has a 105 because they're in lots of advanced classes. Um, but then as far as um, scholarships and things like that, there are some circumstances where they're asking for the unweighted GPA. There are others where they want the weighted. And so we're really parsing through some more complicated layers there um, in this regard. Okay, so just to preview um, our future work, uh, the decision three, once again, is about that consistent application for graduating class. Um, and it also includes the calculation. And so um, because it's hard to talk about any decision point um, in a silo, we've already started delving into this conversation and they've started writing their individual reflections here. So um, I foresee us having a lot of conversation around what courses are included in our weighted GPA um, for class rank purposes. 
um, because there are some school districts that um, do not include all courses in their class, their GPAs for class ranking purposes um, and or for for their weighting as well. And so um, whenever we look at our strategic design framework, we know that it is important to us that we are encouraging students to take risks and to foster their own unique successes. Um, and so we want to make sure that we do not um, create a system that inadvertently discourages them from taking choice classes. So I'll give an example. There are some school districts in our comparison group who only include the four core courses in languages other than English when ranking students. Everything else goes into the GPA, but class rank comes from the four core and, and that. There are other um, school districts that only that, that designate numbers of semesters of certain things. So we'll do four semesters of um, ELA, four semesters of math, uh, et cetera. Um, there are others who even um, take, it, take a different tack on it and say all students must take at least six credits of unweighted classes. Okay, so there there are a lot of different angles on this, um, and so I think we'll have some really um, lively conversation that I look forward to sharing with you in regard to this decision point. That was actually going to be one, that was actually mm -hmm. one of my questions. If that was a discussion, the the mm -hmm. unweighted requirements, um, class requirements, that was the question I was going to have. Um, if you'd mm -hmm. had that conversation. Yes, ma'am. We've we've started it. Um, I I'm quite the taskmaster. They they keep trying to have this conversation when we're not ready for it, and I keep bumping them back. Like, um, but they but just based on the the things that they're already saying at the committee meetings, absolutely. I think we'll have conversation there. Okay. And then in decision four with lo um, sorry, local graduation honors, um, we also know that. Um, if now that we are, are at this point including dual credit, that will shift our timeline potentially on when we do our final ranking of students um, to make sure we have those grades in because our dual credit classes at our comprehensive high schools are all senior level classes. Um, we also, um, I also anticipate taking a look at um, the way we um, designate our honor graduate groups simply because if we're move, moving to a tier three, you know, three tier system, it's going to shift um, the cutoff points there as well in that section. Okay. So I, I mentioned this earlier, but I just want to stress um, how our strategic framework and, and our vision for the future really are the foundation for our work as a committee. And we keep coming back to that. And so at our last update, I had shared with you how the, the group was feeling a little bit uh, scratchy, if you will, about whether or not our current policy aligned. Um, and so box number four in, um, shows you the, uh, the shift. So we are, we are nowhere near the end of our work, but we are feeling good about it. And so I wanted to share that celebration with you um, that we are feeling like the changes that we are making are bringing us much more closely in alignment with our vision statement and the, the strategic design framework. Um, and so as far as our next steps, uh, just to be to be clear, we're going to keep keep working, keep keep on keeping on in January. Um, after we feel like we're in a good place with our consensus decision building, we will work as an internal team to capture those concepts and move them into that more formal um, policy language so that you would be able to review that as well. Um, we will be working with our, our technology department on our student information systems to make sure that it can do all of these things that we want it to be able to do as a system. Um, and then we will certainly confer, um, confer with TASB and, and TASB Policy Council uh, regarding our wording and make sure that it is, it is actually saying what we mean for it to say. Um, that legally sometimes, you know, is not, not quite the same as what we would say when speaking to one another. Um, I can't see Mr. Ben's face, but that's, um, and then um, we will certainly continue to, to bring draft concepts and wording back to you as we work our way forward in this process. So at this time, once again, this is not an action item, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. I do have one question. So, um, and, and also I want to tell you that I, I love what we're getting in Transmittal. Um, it's, it, I feel like we're getting, we're really learning a lot um, from what you're sending us. So thank you for that very thorough. Um, so my question is, I know that you're comparing to other school districts. Have you guys talked to any of these other school districts, had conversations with them, ones that potentially or maybe recently changed their 
GPA systems? Yes, I've had um, extensive uh, conversations with, with multiple school districts, um, one of which just revised their policy. Oh uh, goodness, I think it was approved by their board last May or June. Um, it was a large, comparable school district as well. Um, and I will I will also um, be transparent in that as we go to our Holdsworth collaboratives and are able to network with other school districts um, and have those moments over lunch to bring it up and ask questions, I'm, I've been taking those opportunities as well. So um, we've reached out directly to several of the official comparison school districts, and then we've also been working the network as well to make sure we're getting a, a wide variety. Um, I, I've said this many times, but I can't stress enough that this policy is local. It is as individual to every school district as any policy I've ever seen. Um, and so that's why it's so important we align it to our our beliefs. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. I, I love the guiding principles, reading through these and seeing that you are always, always thinking about our individual students and their successes and making sure that we are not inadvertently um, forgetting those with our GPA system. Yes, ma'am. Um, I really appreciate that. And having it written down for us to see and to know that y'all are thinking about it, awesome. Thank you. And I have to say, I'm smiling over here. I already gave my kudos and thanks to the group, but it was the first time that I saw your your next data point on the little survey. And I just think, I mean, that just makes me really beam. I mean, we really are, it, there was a turn and the whole group is really thinking about how does it, that policy and the decisions we're making in there, uh, you know, align with our framework and align with the goals that we have for all of our students. So, we, I mean, that's, that's amazing to see that 100%. On, on the number four, so it's great. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Ms. Parkinson. Thank you. That brings us to item I-1, consideration, discussion, and possible action to adopt a resolution declaring the district's intent to discontinue participation in TRS active care in favor of alternative group health insurance and coverage options options for eligible employees. Mr. Martindale. Thank you, Ms. Torak. Here with additional information on this agenda item and recommended action is our Chief Administrative Officer, Ms. Molly Perry. Thank you, Mr. Martindale. Mr. Horak, members of the board, I uh, come to you uh, this evening with a much abbreviated version of the presentation uh, that we reviewed together in workshop earlier this evening. Uh, also, I did fail to mention that we have a guest uh, with us this evening. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Bob Tracy with Gallagher Consulting. Uh, he has been instrumental in helping us in this final stretch of really understanding uh, some of those options that we have uh, as it relates to our, our health care in the future here in College Station. ISD. So with that, we'll go through uh, a few of the highlights of earlier's, uh, earlier in the evening's presentation, and then uh, we'll have some opportunity for any final uh, consideration and discussion uh, before possible action. So uh, as uh, explained, uh, Senate Bill 1444 is new legislation coming out of the uh, regular session uh, that concluded early this summer. And this allows us this new opportunity that we've not previously had under state statute to discontinue or opt out of participation in TRS active care uh, beginning as early as September 1, 2022, which is the first day of the 22-23 plan year. Uh, as always, it's important to know that that decision is binding for five years. So we must also provide notice to TRS if we intend to opt out uh, by December 31st of this month. We have uh, engaged in uh, quite a bit of work since uh, learning of the passage of this new law. Uh, in fact, we began discussions with the board in July uh, in talking about uh, the legislation and then coming to you all uh, and chartering that committee to really engage in the conversation at the August meeting. Our, our committee met three times over the course of about a month and uh, a half and uh, gave us the green light as an administration to move forward and really thoroughly exploring uh, what these options would be and assuming that uh, the numbers were uh, feasible and beneficial to our uh, employees to, to move forward. And so we did just that uh, as an administration, uh, had an uh, engagement in subsequent work over the course of several months uh, where we really looked at uh, what potential consultants could assist us in this process as, a, as well as what options we would have. Uh, along the way, of course, we've been providing updates to you all as a board of 
of Trustees, uh, as well as various committees throughout the district, such as uh, DEIC and PAC. So at this juncture, we do have three options for the 22 23 plan year, uh, the first of which would be to remain with TRS Active Care. Uh, we know this plan. We've been uh, part of TRS Active Care since the early 2000s. It is fully funded. Uh, what we also know is that TRS is making some changes to regional rating and uh, that our increase is likely to be at least 5% minimum, uh, perhaps more, depending on uh, the participants in the pool after this opt-out period has uh, concluded. Uh, we should know uh, as early as April of 2022 uh, what those uh, rates might look like, but we typically don't really have much information about TRS plans until summer. It is also important to remember that if we were to decide to remain in TRS, we would have another opportunity at this time next year for uh, the 23-24 plan year. Uh, the next option uh, that we have uh, discovered along the way is uh, TASB Health, which is also a fully funded plan. Uh, similar to TRS, it is governed by a board of trustees. Uh, it is tethered to the Texas Municipal League, which is a, an entity that serves governmental agencies uh, throughout the state of Texas. So it does have a large pool uh, with that TML plan. Uh, we uh, fortunately do have rates and plans established uh, right now. <coughs> excuse me, for 22-23, which is very unusual uh, for plans to uh, establish those this far in advance. Uh, what is most encouraging about the option of TASB Health is that those plans are uh, comparable and in some areas, uh, specifically uh, areas such as prescription plans, are improved over our existing TRS active care rates and plans. Uh, TASB Health is, is one option and we have that in hand, but uh, even if we were to discontinue participating Participation moving forward, we could also go to that free market in the spring uh, to uh, engage in a more formal request for proposal or RFP and really garner what kind of uh, plans might be out there and at what types of rates that are uh, self-funded. So there would be certainly a wide range of options and flexibility. Uh, determining whether that would be a better the option uh, versus TASB Health uh, really cannot be established until we were to go through that formal RFP process in the spring. So in summary, we know that we have uh, new options to discontinue TRS active care as a result of Senate Bill 1444. Uh, we're very aware as employees that those rates have continued to increase uh, significantly over the past several years. In fact, the average rate of increase uh, for the current plan year was 8%. An analysis of our uh, recent claims data over the course of uh, the last three years reveals uh, that our employees' premiums have exceeded claims by the amount of $1.68 million. We also know uh, in hearing from TRS directly that their future is very uncertain with this option for healthier pools to uh, discontinue participation. Uh, that will certainly impact their rates and uh, the notification deadline uh, is a challenge because we're not able to secure a self-funded plan uh, that uh, far in advance. Meanwhile, TASB Health does offer this fully funded plan uh, with comparable plans and rates to those existing active care rates and plans in 21-22, meaning if we were ultimately to uh, opt into TASB Health as our choice outside of TRS, uh, our employees could expect to not see a rate increase next year. Self-funded options, uh, regardless uh, if we were to opt out, would be explored and a final recommendation about plans would be made in the spring should we choose to discontinue. Lastly, but certainly not least, it is the recommendation of administration that College Station ISD discontinue participation in TRS Active Care beginning in the 22-23 plan year. With that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I would um, move to discontinue participation in TRS active care in favor of alternative group health insurance and coverage options for eligible employees as presented in the uh, proposed resolution. I'll Second. All right. Not sure if you got that, but whoever. Um, we Thank have Mr. A, President, you have to... Uh, 
go on record. I think Blaine had second. it. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, I would like to thank Mr. Tracy for your expertise um, in, in this and in, in leading and in, in helping us understand more of our options going forward because I think this kind of clarified everything as Ms. Perry in workshop and then today. So I do appreciate you being here. Thank you. Uh, other than that, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Here we go. <laughs> all right, brings us to J1. That, that motion carried 7 0. Correct. 7 0, yes, that is correct. I'm sorry. Mr. All right. Uh, J1, consider and act on an order authorizing the issuance of unlimited tax school bar building bonds, appointing a pricing officer and delegating to the pricing officer the authority to approve the sale of the bonds, establishing certain parameters for the approval of such matters, leaving an annual ad valorem tax for the payment of the bonds, and enacting other provisions relating to the subject, Mr. Martindale. That's so long we have two people here to present on this particular item. First, we have uh, Mr. Victor Quiro, our financial advisor. Uh, Victor will lead us through the financial aspect of our bond sale. You have a packet from him in front of you that will est establish uh, the parameters that are acceptable for the bond sale. Uh, following Victor will be Jeff Gobus, Gobus our uh, bond counsel. Uh, Jeff will come forward with the actual order that that uh, authorizes the, the issuance of uh, also appointing a pricing officer and all other required documents associated with this uh, agenda item. So. Victor, it's good to see you again. Welcome Likewise. back. Thank you very much. Uh, honorable President, members of the board, Mr. Bartendale, thank you for having me here this evening. For the record, my name is Victor Quiroga with Specialized Public Finance, and we have the honor of representing the district as your financial advisor. Uh, for the newer board members, basically uh, my job, I'm just an extension of the finance department, and I help the district uh, finance new projects or refinance old debt, and really my main job is to try to get you the lowest interest rate possible. So we're here this evening to uh, present to you a plan to move forward with the authorization that the voters gave us in November for a little over $78 million. And so uh, this presentation here, the first slide, and you have a um, copy in front of you too. Some of these numbers get a little bit small, so it might be easier to read on the handout. But as you know, in November 2021, the voters allowed us to move forward on three of the four propositions for $78,125,000. Uh, when we structured this uh, is so that it would be a no tax rate increase bond program, we uh, structured it so that the majority of the bonds will be paid off over a 25-year period. Except for the technology proposition, uh, which is a little over $4.5 million, that will be paid off in the the first five years so that we won't extend the economic life of those uh, shorter lived items. As I indicated earlier, uh, this bond program will not increase your, the INS tax rate. Currently, our INS tax rate is 26.3 cents. Uh, after the issuance of the bonds, that will not go up based off of our conservative projections. Um, when we plan for these bonds, we also are very concerned when it comes to the interest rates, just because we don't know what's going to happen next week, much less six months down the line. Uh, so the information that we're prepared this evening uh, has an interest rate for a 25-year bond of about 2.3%. Right now, that's actually a little higher than what we're seeing in the current market. Um, uh, it, 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 and the plan, based off of your approval, will be to enter the bond market after we prepare the offer documents, visit with the rating agencies, and go into the the bond market on February 1st. And what we mean by that is we uh, bid it out, have a bid specs, and then whoever gives us the lowest interest rate bid on February 1st uh, will be awarded th the bonds. Um, the authority that you're considering this evening will be basically for us to continue moving forward on that work, uh, going to the market February 1st, which is not a board meeting date. This allows the district to go into the bond market without us having to plan a bond sale around whenever your board meeting will be. Um, and essentially, you're delegating that authority to Mr. Martindale or Ms. Draws to sign the final documents to lock in that interest rate. Uh, we don't just uh, go in there, we, we set uh, parameters and thresholds, um, and these are the parameters here in the bottom that you see that we cannot exceed as we move forward. I'll, I'll skip a little bit of some of that just so I could have Jeff Golbus uh, have a little bit to talk about and not let me do all the talking. Um, so the next page here, this is a pro forma model. Basically, this is a, a, a summary of the tax rate impact model 
on how we plan for these bonds. So in the uh, bar, bar chart here um, on the left axis, that's the bond debt service payments that you have uh, per year on a dollar amount. The green bars, that's the existing debt that you have right now. The gray bars on top is the new proposed debt and how we're going to layer that in. Uh, probably the most important thing here is that red line and that's related to the right axis is it's your tax rate. As you can see there, we're going to be able to maintain your INS tax rate at 26.3 cents and as you continue to pay off bonds as scheduled and earlier than scheduled, uh, that tax rate would eventually uh, go down. And Victor, you, yes, you'd like, you may have been about to touch on it, but the, the, the second bullet, your projections assume a 1% growth on values, correct? That's exactly Very right. conservative. Very conservative, yes, sir. Um, and that's a good segue into here. And I prefer the previous uh, graphs just because it's a little hard uh, to, to read here. Uh, but basically, the, the bar graph summarizes this tax rate impact model that we prepare for our clients whenever you're considering a bond program. Uh, I'm not going to go line by line or column by column, but the one I'll focus on, as Mr. Martindale indicated, is the uh, column B and column C. This is your property values. And so we're being very conservative through the direction Ms. Draws in that we're uh, uh, assuming a, a annual growth rate of 1% per year over the next two years. And then after that, it's going to be 0%. And, you know, being uh, homeowners in Texas, we probably won't uh, see that. And so, uh, again, this is very conservative. So uh, it's an inverse relationship. As your property values go up, the tax rate goes down because uh, you're able to generate more uh, uh, value, uh, property uh, revenue from that. The other column that I'll point out, just because just to mention that the district has been very prudent with your finances, uh, column E there, that defeased uh, debt service, Basically, that's our fancy way of saying we're paying off debt earlier than scheduled. Uh, the past couple of years, we've had a defeasance program. Uh, this past year, we paid off a million dollars earlier. Uh, this year, we're going to schedule to pay off about $3 million earlier. So again, that's the uh, district being very prudent with taxpayer monies. Uh, most important column here is the left side. On um, the right side, I'm sorry, in column L, that's your projected INS tax rate. Again, we're going to be able to keep it at 26.3 uh, cents. And as your property values grow, you could either reduce that tax rate or just use that extra money to continue paying off debt uh, early. The next slide here, this is the summarized uh, timetable events for this. Basically, we're asking you for your authority to move forward on this. Uh, again, we're, uh, we're hoping to go into the bond market February 1st. Um, the district is uh, very financially strong and stable. It has an outstanding bond rating of AA1 by Moody's. And what that means, basically, we're just one notch below the perfect bond rating that you could get of a AAA. So that's a good indication that the board and the district has made wise financial decisions over the years, and that's recognized by the bond rating agencies and also by bond investors that we'll be approaching uh, in the couple months. Uh, historically, the district has been able to attract a number of bids for your bonds, and so that's a good indication that we'll be able to get a good market rate for you uh, come February 1st. So after all that, uh, we'll lock in the rate February 1st, and then that'll schedule us to close on the transaction February 24th. No meeting is required for that one either. Uh, that's just done electronically uh, via bank wire. The last page here, ladies and gentlemen, this is just a, a, a look at the interest rate environment for specifically for tax exempt municipal bonds uh, going back the last 10 years. Uh, as you can see here on the right side, that's the present time that we're in right now. Uh, interest rates are still low. Obviously, the discussion right now uh, nationwide is just about inflation, and we are starting to see some of those interest rates in other financial sectors like mortgages and everything, treasuries uh, start to go up. Uh, the municipal bond market, these types of bonds we're looking uh, to issue soon. Uh, we've been pretty stable considering all the economic news uh, and concerns going on. So um, based on the fact that you all have a strong credit rating, strong financials, anticipate us having a, a, a wonderful sale come February 1st. Um, I'll stop talking about the finances and this plan unless you have any other questions, but I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Golbus who prepared the agenda item that you're considering this evening. Good evening, President, members of the board. My name is Jeff Golbus with McCall, Parkerson, Horton. We've had the pleasure of uh, serving as the district's bond council for a number of years. Um, Mr. Horak, my apologies for making you read that agenda language. I prepare that, but I assure you were in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Um, Victor gets the more exciting job, which is the numbers. Mine is much less dry. Um, I do quickly need to brown nose on your staff. Um, the election, considering the November election cycle, was a huge success. It, it was brutal. 
for school district elections in November. Um, of all of mine, this is the only district where um, we did not have to chase items down. Uh, I've got a complete file at the end of the election, so staff did a phenomenal job. And there's a lot of behind the scenes and work, uh, and I didn't even need to do much prodding or poking at all. So. Um, as Victor said, this um, this sale method with the parameters order is not new to the district. College Station ISD has used this method of sale. As Victor touched on, it gives us a lot of flexibility. So the board gives the authorization tonight um, with, to a pricing officer. Historically, and with this bond sales, that's the superintendent and chief financial officer. After tonight's board meeting, they have the authority to move forward with finalizing the sale of the bonds. This will use all authorization that the voters approved in November. So in doing so, we put certain parameters or the box that the superintendent and chief financial officer have to work with before we can sell those bonds. We cannot sell more bonds than the voters approved. That's obvious. Uh, we cannot go further than what the voters were told. So right now the maximum maturity would be August 15th, 2047. And then uh, we have a maximum true interest cost of the series of bonds at 4%. That is the metric that is going to move the most. We can't go higher than four. As Victor said, markets are a little bit up and down. Um, so we can't exceed that. Certainly the goal is to come under that. Ultimately, right now, as Victor said, we're scheduled to enter the market and take competitive bids on February 1. Once that happens, um, the pricing officer, superintendent, chief financial officer will, will see those and they must uh, give us the verbal sign off after they've reviewed the bids, reviewed the final structure. I will confirm that we have hit these parameters that the board has established and only at that time can we let the bidders know that the district accepts the terms of the sale. Um, as alluded, these are obviously tax exempt bonds. In January, I'll work with, with Amy to go over uh, various items to ensure tax compliance, but having knowledge of the district, your past programs and these projects, we're not gonna have any issues with that. Um, obviously, the benefit of that is it brings your borrowing costs down because your bondholders obviously aren't paying income tax on the interest on your bonds. Um, uh, I'm happy to answer any legal questions you have related to this order, but um, otherwise, um, this this would be well in line with past district practices for these types of bond sales. I move to approve the order as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. And motion passes 7 0. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate cool. it. Thank Good you. To work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that'll bring us to item J2 consideration, discussion, and possible action regarding the annual fis financial and compliance report for the fiscal year ended. August 31st, 2021. Mr. Martindale. Thank you, Mr. Horak and board members. Here to present us with our financial audit for year ending August 31, 2021 is Rebecca Goldstein from Weaver and Tidwell. Rebecca. Thank you very much for having me. Um, you should all have in front of you um, the annual financial report. It's a bound report, about 100 pages. It looks like this. And then there's also um, a four page document that's a required letter to the board. So I did present the, the audited financial report and required communication to the audit committee earlier today. I will go through, um, the four page letter is just required communication, so I'll go through that. Um, and then I will just touch on some highlights in the annual financial report and certainly can answer any questions um, as we go through. And I think next year I'm actually gonna have a PowerPoint of some type of summary because I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm missing out on that. Um, so, because I can make this interesting, I promise. <laughs> um, so, you know, our, the first page of the letter basically just talks about what our responsibility is in relation to the financial statement audit. So our responsibility is to form and express opinions about whether the financial statements that have been prepared by management with the board's oversight is presented fairly in all material respects. Um, 
I am required to say that the, the audit itself obviously does not relieve management or the board of, of the responsibilities of um, the numbers. Um, our responsibility is to plan and perform the audit to obtain reasonable but not absolute assurance. So what that means is um, we know we can't look at every single transaction. We do a number of different audit techniques such as sampling, comparing to budget, analyticals, things like that. But obviously there are so many um, numbers going in and out um, for the year. We, we don't look at everything but we do base our, our test work on materiality and risk assessments and things like that. Um, we also take into consideration internal control, which is that second paragraph as well. And what that means is we come in usually before the, the books are closed and um, have Thad and his team walk us through some of the financial statement processes like cash receipts, cash disbursements, capital assets, bond payments, financial close, all of those things. And so we take those that walkthrough into consideration. We take controls into consideration. So we, we consider um, management approvals and authorizations and things like that, and we test certain controls in those major processes. So then that can give us um, some reliance and some um, assurance, if you will, that those numbers, that we don't have to dig so deep in, in those areas because there are good processes and controls. And so um, if we did find something that was um, needed to be a reportable condition in terms of controls, we would have that in the report, which we did not find anything there. Um, we are responsible to communicate any other significant matters relevant to your responsibilities. Um, we didn't have anything there. As far as the plan scope and timing of the audit, that was in accordance with the engagement letter that was signed. Um, basically, we come in for about a week in uh, before the books are closed, before August, so summertime, and then we do the majority of our work in October, November, and then we go back to our offices and accumulate the information and, and write the report. In terms of compliance, we are um, we do follow our ethical requirements in, regarding independence, so we are independent of the ISD. If you go on to page two of the letter, we do offer or we do um, perform some non-audit or non-attest services, and really what those are is anything that we do in relation to the audit, but it's it's outside the actual audit work itself. So part of that is, you know, we help management put together this report. Again, the numbers are audited, the numbers come from management, um, but we help actually put the document together with all of the required exhibits and things like that. And we makes we help management make certain entries, if you will, to get to, from the fund level statement, which is the daily operations and where where the district budgets to the government wide, which is a required, um, some required statements in the report, which is really just a once a year exercise. In terms of significant accounting policies, those are noted in note one. We did implement a new GASB this year, GASB 84. It has to do with fiduciary activities. So the fiduciary funds look a little different this year. Um, it's ma mainly presentation. Where, where we used to say agency funds, we, we now say custodial funds. So those are the, those are the funds um, with your student activity funds and things like that, but not a major change that this year. There were no significant unusual transactions, no accounting policies based on any type of unauthoritative or lack of authoritative guidance, so nothing there. Um, moving down to the, the middle of the second page, in regards to significant accounting estimates, there are always estimates and financial statements. So if you look, there's, um, you know, there's some significant estimates that will bring to your attention and uh, allowable costs, or excuse me, allowance for uncollectible taxes. So there is an allowance, um, and that's an estimate for uh, the amount of tax receivable that the district doesn't expect to receive. Um, that number is not not large in, in relation to the receivable itself, but there is a small allowance there. We do consider the foundation school program state aid revenue um, an estimate because those allotments do move and sometimes at the end of the year you have to estimate um, the actual revenue that you will receive based on a final or near final allotment. There are accruals for claims incurred but not reported related to self-insurance workers' compensation fund. So again, that's an estimate as well that typically comes from an actuary. And then we have depreciation expense. So that number is based off an estimate of your useful lives of your capital assets. So again, that's an estimate. And then we have net pension liability and net OPEB liability. Um, those are the two liabilities that um, come from TEA and those actuaries. And so that you can see there, we base those up, they're off of a third party actuarial valuation. So the district doesn't have a whole lot of control over those numbers, but those are considered estimates as well. 
So again, management estimates are based on historical experiments, experience or information provided by third parties. We found those estimates to be reasonable. If you move on to page three, um, a lot of this is none, 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 which is where you want to be. We didn't have any significant difficulties encountered during the audit. We didn't have any uncorrected or corrected misstatements, which is actually really huge, I will say, because we didn't have any material adjustments to the numbers that we would have to present. So what that means is when the numbers came to us, they were good. We didn't have to say, hey, you missed this, or hey, did you book this? There really wasn't anything material that we had to change when the numbers came to us. So that's really, um, really speaks well to the business staff. We didn't have any disagreements with management. We do ask management to sign a representation letter at the end of the audit. That's just part of our due diligence of every audit, just to make sure that management is represented, that they've provided us everything that we've asked for, that they're true, um, you know, un unfalsified documents, things like that. So we want to make sure that we get representations from management. There were no other management consultations with other accountants, no other significant matters, findings, or issues. And then the other information and documents and audited financial statements on that last page, that just talks about that there are other information in the audited report that not everything has the same level of assurance, if you will. So there's the school first indicators in the back that really aren't part of the audit, but they're part of this document. Um, you know, things like MDNA, which is really management's discussion and analysis. We read that, we make sure it coincides with the numbers, but that's not part of the audited um, financial statements, if you will. So again, that's my required communication. I will say the main takeaway is it was a clean audit this year. Um, I will echo the bond council and say that the, the staff was really great to work with. We didn't have to uh, hassle to get everything we needed. We got everything that we asked for timely, um, and that's a huge thing. So when we roll out of the, the final field work, we actually have everything we need to complete the audit. We got everything timely and everything was clean. So um, kudos to, to the business office staff for that. Um, I will just walk through some of the highlights. I know this is a big document and I went through some of it with the audit committee. But just so you, you know what some of those highlights are, the first couple pages is, is the um, table of contents. But if you look at page three, that's actually where the independent auditor's report is. So that is a clean opinion. So that's where you want to be. Those are, that's page three through five. Management's discussion and analysis starts on page seven. That is really a good summary of the year because the financial statements themselves are really based on this year. But MDNA actually kind of compares how the district, what um, the numbers from this year to last year, from budgeted to actual. So the financial highlights and the overview in the MDNA is a good place to start. Um, let's see. The first actual financial statements is in our Exhibit A1 on page 17. That's your statement of net position, and your statement of changes is our <clears throat> statement of changes is on page 18 and 19. So I will say that those two financial statements are at the government-wide level. They're not at the level that the district budgets. So what that means is these financial statements starting on page 17 through 19, really have all of your long-term liabilities and your long-term assets, so like your capital assets and your debt, um, which is a different type of presentation than what you budget, than how you budget in your fund accounting. And so those are those statements there. You can see on page 17 that your net position um, is at 44.7 million. You have a, there is a, a negative unrestricted net position, and that's really because when we implemented GASB 86 and GASB 75 with the pension and OPEB liabilities, those made those balance, that balance negative. But really, if you look at starting on your, your fund level statement, starting on page 20, your general fund has a fund balance, it's a strong fund balance of over 4, 34 million. You have about nine million of that fund balance reserved for construction and land purchases. And then you can see on page 20 and 21, some of your other major funds presented. You have your debt service fund and your capital projects fund, which are presented every year. You also have your elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund presented this year. That's your ARPA money and your, um, some of the COVID-19 funds that was presented as a major fund this year. You can see about $2.7 million in revenue in those funds. 
And then there are some reconciliations. So if you want to see the differences between your government-wide presentation and your fund presentation, page 23 actually goes through a reconciliation of that those, the fund balance to the net position balance. So you can see the main differences there, there are the presentation of your long-term liabilities and your presentation of your long-term assets. So your bonds payable and your capital assets. Again, page 24 and 25 are your revenues and expenditures at your fund level. I will point out on page 24, your general fund. You actually have, um, there's a net change balance of a deficit of 1.4 million. If you go to exhibit G1 on page 65, that actually has a comparison of your, your general fund revenues and expenditures to what was budgeted. So again, if it's exhibit G1, page 65, you can see that there was a, there was a deficit uh, fund balance change of 2.6 million budgeted. Actual came out to um, better than that at actually 1.4 deficit. And you can see there part of that is um, a $620,000 um, payment for winter and hailstorm damage, so insurance recoveries there. And that's under, those are under extraordinary items. So again, um, budget to actual for general fund, um, is it on exhibit G-1. I will bring so, you- Re Rebecca, uh -huh. quick question. Uh, on exhibit G-1, and you mm -hmm. mentioned we adopted a 2-6, we're coming in audited at 1-4, mm -hmm. and included in that 1-4 is uh, an expended uh, extraordinary item yes. uh, of repairs to facilities due to storm damage of 600. Mm -hmm. So out, outside of that, we, obviously would have ended around that 800 mark. Correct? Yes, yes, okay. correct. You can't really predict when you're gonna get those insurance recoveries. I know that's hard, <laughs> um, but yes, that's a good point. So I will take you back to page 26. Page 26 actually is a reconciliation. Again, if you wanna know the difference between the net change in your fund balance of negative 3.5 million to get to your change in net position of 1.3. and I will point out the negative 3.5 fund balance is your is all of your government funds, and most of that is in your capital projects funds where you're spending the money on your capital projects. Page 27 starts your proprietary funds. So those are your business type activities like your kids club and your community sports camps and things like that. It also includes your internal service fund, which is your work, workers' compensation fund. So those balance sheet and income statements are on page 27 and 28. They also have cash flows, which are on page 29. And then page 30 and 31 are your custodial funds. So those are your student activity funds that the district holds, um, assets that the district holds in a custodial capacity. And then page 33 starts with your notes and you have several pages of notes. I would just say if there's any balances on any of these statements that you have questions on, usually some of it's covered in the notes. So you have an actual roll forward of your fixed assets. You have a roll forward of your bond payments. If you wanted to see where you started it in the beginning of the year to payments made to ending balance, all of that can be found in your notes. Um, required supplementary information starts on page 65. Again, you have part of your required information is to present a general fund budget to actual, so that's an exhibit G1. G2 through G5 are actually required schedules of your net pension and your net OPEB liability. So you can see the changes there in those liabilities. And again, those are, those are prescribed numbers that come from an actuary. And then page 71, and 72 are actually notes to those RSI schedules. And then if you wanted to see any of particular funds that are not presented in the fund, so some of the smaller funds like your Head Start Fund or your National School Breakfast and Lunch Fund, those actually start on page 74. Those are what we call your combining statements. So you can see all of your individual funds there, all of your balance sheet and income statement items for your individual funds there. And those numbers actually roll up into the non-major fund category in your financial statements there. Also in the back, you can see um, in particular your business type activities. So if you look at page 82 and 83, 
you can see all of your individual funds and your business type activities. So again, your kids club, your community education fund, um, your community sports camps, all of those um, roll up into your not your enterprise funds. Those actually have cash flows as well on page 85. Schedule J1 on 86 and 87 is actually um, a schedule of your delinquent taxes receivable. Again, that's a required schedule that TEA asked for. So those are in your financial statements every year. That 1.47 million to the right there at the last column actually ties into your financial statements as your um, tax receivable. And then exhibits J2 and J3 are more budget to actual required schedules. So you're, you have a budget to actual schedule for your debt service fund and for your national school breakfast and lunch. Okay, we are nearing the end. There is um, there's an overall compliance and internal control section. So starting on page 93, this is the second opinion that we give. It's an opinion under government auditing standards. So it talks about internal control over financial reporting. It talks about compliance and other matters. So beyond the actual numbers, um, we are required to look at compliance with certain laws and provisions. So we look at things like PIT code testing. We look at um, things like, you know, did you, we look at big vendor purchases and make sure that those purchases went through the proper bid processes. So there's a lot of compliance testing. We look at PFIA, which is part of your investment act compliance. So a lot of that compliance testing doesn't show up in the numbers, but we are required to do that. We do that testing. And if we had any findings, we would report them to you. Uh, we don't, we did not find any, any findings in that area, which is where you want to be. Starting on page 95 is your compliance for each major federal program and report on internal control over compliance. This opinion actually speaks to the compliance for the expenditures of your federal funds. So that's all of the COVID-19 money that was spent this year. It's your National Food and Breakfast Program. It's your Head Start. It's in any of that money that comes from the federal government that the district spends. We don't look at every program every year, but we do have a formula that's required to be used. And so we alternate those audits of the major programs this year. And so you can see on page 97, um, that's kind of where you want to be in terms of a lot of no's and none reported. That means there's there was no reportable findings. So we issued an unmodified opinion, which is the best opinion you want to get. That's a clean opinion. We did not have any internal control findings over re financial reporting. We didn't have any internal control or compliance findings under federal awards. We issued an unmodified opinion again under federal awards. Number seven there on page 97 actually identifies the major programs that we audited this year in terms of your federal awards. So we looked at Title I, again, because we did have a finding there last year. That was a clean audit this year. We looked at all of your ESSER and your PPRP, which is just a lot of your COVID-19 funding federal dollars that you got this year. We looked at all of that that was spent in fiscal year 21. And then we looked at your child nutrition cluster again, which is your school breakfast and lunch program. And again, all of those were clean. If you look on page 98, that just identifies the prior year finding that we had, and then the current status says that we implemented procedures were there and the finding was resolved this year. And then page 99 through 100 is your K-1 schedule, which we call your schedule of expenditures of federal awards. So you can see there that breaks down by assistance listing number, all of the federal dollars that were spent this year. You can see on page 100 that the district spent about $19.7 million in federal funding this year. And you can see on page 101 that that's reconciled to um, the statement of changes with the difference being some school health and related services revenue. And then the last page is the first indicators there. And as I was telling the audit committee, all of those answers are where you want to be. <laughs> you have all the right yeses and nos, which is very important. Um, so again, no findings, it's a clean audit. Um, you know, we did, we looked at all of the major federal funding this year. There was a lot of, lot of moving pieces in the audit this year and, and um, overall it went very smoothly. And so y'all should, I think, be very proud of your business staff for that. Are there any questions that I can answer from anybody? Okay, thank you very much. I think we're looking for a motion. 
I move we approve the annual financial compliance report for fiscal year ending August 31, 2021. I second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for making the trip. Uh, that brings us to item J3, consideration, discussion, and possible action related to the annual enrollment review and report, FC Local. Mr. Martindale. Thank you, Mr. Orak. Uh, board members, ever in November or December, we're to take our demographers' projections and information and apply policy FC Local. Uh, here to do that this evening uh, is our Chief Financial Officer, Ms. Amy Dross. Ms. Dross. Thank you, Mr. Martindale, members of the board. Um, so as, I don't think they're all working, but I'll look at the right one. Okay, he said forget. Um, as mentioned, we're gonna do the annual um, enrollment and review as required by FC Local. Um, and what we're looking at is specifically capacities of our facilities. We wanna be very efficient with those. Uh, using the projections that the demographer shared with you earlier today, um, but we're focusing more on five years of data instead of the 10 that he's, he goes out with. The farther you get out, um, the, you know, it's, it's harder to estimate closely. So we're going to, we focus in on five years. Um, we'll also uh, be very specific and inform you of those campuses that enrollment is either below 85% of the official building capacity or above 100, 110%. So we want to bring that to your attention. Um, we also look at the comparable composition. That would be the economically disadvantaged percentages at each school. Um, so according to FC Local, we look at it, we would be considered comparable for intermediate and middle schools if that percentage is at 15 percentage points difference um, or, or less and at 12% for our high schools. It doesn't say we have to be there, um, but that's just kind of what previously we have established as um, would be comparable limits. So uh, some of this data you've seen before, but uh, I'll highlight some of it. So for 21-22, uh, you see two numbers there for enrollment. The, the number in parentheses, 14,209, is um, the data that was sent to the demographer at the time he started his, his work um, for the report and the projections. But we all know it changes every day. So um, the 14,189 was uh, the official enrollment at snapshot date. Um, I like to use snapshot date because if you pull anything from TEA, that's what they're going to report. And if we use snapshot date for historical comparisons, we know we're always looking at the same time of year. Um, so the 14-189 is snapshot date. Amy, um, when is snapshot date? It is the last uh, school day of October. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, in comparison to last year's snapshot date enrollment, um, we had right at a 4% um, enrollment growth. I will tell you last year when the demographer was here, he was estimating 3.9. So I would say he got it really close. Um, so that is awesome. Um, looking to the next several years, still projecting growth, uh, 14,593, about a 2.7 percent growth for 22-23. Um, that's the budget that we will st uh, start working on uh, pretty soon. And then 2.4 for the next couple of years. And then I see a little more conservative as you look out five uh, years or so, so 1.8, 1.7. But um, the thing to note is we are projected to continue to grow in student enrollment. Um, so looking at this, I'm not going to go over each campus, but um, I want to go over the, the columns, tell you what they are, and we'll focus on a couple of the uh, campuses here. Um, but the number you see in parentheses next to the school name is what we consider the capacity of the school. And then we've calculated that 85% and the 110%, the high and the low um, for our capacity issues. And we've highlighted in green if they are below that 85% um, percentage of capacity and highlighted in red if they're projected to be above the 110%. Um, so let's look at uh, Greens Prairie, looking at this one right here. 
So for 21-22, right now, um, or at the, the point of his, whenever he looked at his projections in the data, 542 students. Um, compared to the 561 at 85%, we are below that. So we've shaded that in green just to, to bring note of that to you. And then we are kind of within that. After that, we're getting closer. In fact, we exceed the actual capacity, but we're still under the 110 as it grows out for the next several years. Looking at Pebble Creek, uh, this is one that the demographer, that area that um, he focused on for some high growth. Again, we are below the um, 80, 110%, between that 85 and 110, but looking at 25, 26 and 26, 27, uh, going over that 110% of capacity. Uh, so that's one that we need to, to monitor. And then Southwood Valley as well. Um, another one with some uh, neighborhoods that are expanding a lot. So while we are within the, those ranges um, until we look at 26, 27. Um, but the interesting thing to note is that when you do look at the 660 and these totals, it is there. We're getting a little close at that point when you get out to 2627, um, but there is capacity. We just have a few of them that we need to uh, monitor. Looking at our grades five and six, um, a little different here. When you look at Cypress Grove and Oakwood, they're highlighted in green across all um, of these years. Uh, the current year plus five years out, that being they are below the 85% of capacity. Um, Pecan Trail is within that range, but you can see there is no red. So they are below the 110%. So uh, again, there is capacity amongst all three schools, but we do have one noticeably um, with a higher enrollment than the other two. And then looking at comparability, um, Pecan Trail having the lowest, when you compare it to Oakwood with the highest percentage, it's in that 19% range or above the 15. Um, so we're gonna denote that, but you also have to remember that Pecan Trail has the highest enrollment. Um, so that's, that's something to consider when you're looking at those percentages. Very similar um, at the middle schools, because these, these are aligned. So you've got Wellburn Middle School um, with the highest uh, enrollment, but still uh, well below that 110% of capacity. And you've got the other two um, in green for all of these years, that being below the 85%. Enough room, room for growth um, across all of these uh, when you look at it in total. And again, looking at those um, percentages for comparability, comparing that highest A&M Consol um, with the lowest of Welburn Middle School. Again, the lowest um, EDA percentages is, is with the campus that has the highest number of students to manage. Um, high school. Um, we're only looking at the comprehensive high schools here. Um, but College Station High School, when you get out to 23, 24 and beyond, um, is in the red, above that 110%. But you can see for a four-year period there, it's, it's estimated to grow by a total of 63 students. So um, while it's, it's not growing really fast in that area, so uh, I think that's certainly manageable. Their comparability, I, I wish I could take credit for this. I wasn't here whenever um, they opened uh, that second high school, but a phenomenal job here, 3.3%. Uh, so uh, that's remarkable that we're, we're within that. So I, I can't take credit for that one. I'll it, pass it, it took on. a couple of chances. A couple <laughs> times. Demographer did. just want to um, ask and make sure, with especially with the elementaries, that how the special programs are accounted for in these numbers. Yes, ma'am. So the actual at enrollment the, at that school. So okay. if there's a special and program and those kids are not zoned there, but they attend that one, they are counted. Got it. Okay, and I gotta say something. I am not 
asking or suggesting that we need to rezone. I am not. I, I think if just you, pointing something out. Right. I think if you allow Ms. Strauss okay. to kind of get to observations okay, still going. and yep. recommendations, I, I, I we might even up. prevent you from no. even saying that word. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm just getting past the numbers and getting to a few more things. So, okay. So observations, let, let, let's kind of summarize um, the, the, the numbers and the data here. Um, overall, um, our elementary schools have capacity um, for the next five years. I'm getting a little tight, but they have capacity, okay? Uh, a couple of them that we need to watch. At the intermediate and middle school levels, uh, there is capacity for the overall enrollment in the future. However, there are discrepancies um, between those campuses when you look at total enrollment. Um, we also recognize that the economically disadvantaged percentages exceed that 15% um, that's listed as what we would consider comparable um, at both intermediate and middle schools. At the high school, um, our observation is that in 23-24, College Station High School exceeds that 110% of established capacity However, um, for four years, we're looking at a potential of 63 student growth, so certainly manageable. And I will point out that for these high schools, these projections do not reflect um, the potential changes um, that were discussed last month at the board meeting for College View High School. Um, we are looking at changing some things there to increase enrollment, which would in fact pull from these high schools. So um, that is not accounted for here. Uh, so that would certainly uh, lessen it a little bit. And now for um, our recommendations. That's also part of FC Local that we bring you some recommendations based on this data to stay efficient. So um, we're recommending that we're going to mo uh, monitor Pebble Creek and Southwood Valley elementaries to determine if there needs to be some adjustments or changes in the future. Uh, that may not be zoning, it may be programs, as mentioned, that maybe we need to move some of those around to adjust some of the enrollments and, and level them out a little bit. Consider offering some discretionary transfers for Pecan Trail to Cypress Grove and from Wellburn Middle School to College Station Middle School beginning in the 22-23 school year. That is offering discretionary transfers uh, to our families from our largest intermediate and middle school to the one that has the, uh, the least enrollment um, to see if that doesn't relieve some of that discrepancy between them. Um, if we proceed with that, then uh, in the fall when we start registrations, of course, there'll be some communication to parents to make sure that they know that's available to them. And then and, the and last this time concern. next year, Ms. Nolet, we would know if that had any type of impact on those numbers. And the last recommendation is to begin a long range facility planning process in the fall of 2022 to address the future facility needs across the district. And that would be elementary through high school, as well as other facilities um, outside of campuses as well. Um, so those are our recommendations uh, based on the data that we have now. Uh, realize we get updated information every year, so uh, we make sure that we are on track. But I'm, I'm very impressed with uh, the demographer and his estimates and how close he's uh, come. And this uh, recovery off of the, the COVID was a hard one to predict, but he got it just spot on. So with that, I'll take any uh, comments or questions. If I can get my thing on. Oh, go ahead. No, Amy, speak to the long range planning facility process and just kind of if that would begin in the fall, kind of what their charge would be and what their work might yield. Sure. Um, so similar to um, a bond committee, but where, you know, a bond committee is probably looking at more specifics. They're looking at long range. So based on even our five and, uh, and 10 year data, um, what we're looking at in the way of future campuses to accommodate our growth. Um, what are some of the program needs, um, other facility needs as well um, that uh, College Station would like to. So it would take a variety, a, a very good mixture of the community, um, representation from various campuses, um, from parents, uh, from community members, from business owners, 
and, and basically taking um, a very detailed look at what the district has um, and where we where they see it going in the next five to ten years uh, not necessarily a specific bond at that point um, and then later a bond planning committee would use that as their probably base data to begin looking at any specific future bond because again the enrollment changes every year so something may alter but it does give uh, that bond committee a, a focus of where um, a larger group had uh, reviewed and looked at where they feel the district needs So to a long-range planning facility committee could start work in the fall, a group of stakeholders, take a look at the demographer's work, our existing facilities, uh, projected enrollments, capacity numbers, all of those types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, work with the architects as well, and kind of uh, with that data, make a long-term, like a 10-year projection as far as needs assessment that's existing facilities and any new facilities that might uh, need to be considered, yes, correct? And then th their work could, in essence, em evolve through the course of the fall into the spring uh, with any particular recommendation for new facilities or an upcoming bond in the future to maybe address some of those needs. Is yes, that correct? That's so correct. the long range planning facility committee would be kind of the foundational work for projecting out 10 years from a facility needs standpoint and last kind of map back bond needs and timing for those particular items. Yes, it and, is. and they would work during the course of the fall into the spring of 23 and if there's any particular recommendations coming out of that to the board, that that would be a year for this coming spring, right. correct? Yeah, I, I kind of look at it as a roadmap um, for a, a committee to look at when they start getting into more specifics because, you know, that the bond committee, when they're looking at one, they've, you've got to think farther out. It's similar to that the financial planning that was talked about earlier. I mean, we're looking at tax rates. Uh, three, five, and ten years out to see if we've got capacity um, within our current tax rate to do some of these things. So, uh, kind of a roadmap. Um, the bond, the actual bond committee might take a little detour and a little different route, but at least it gives them a base to start and work from. Yeah, I saved you from saving the word, Snowman. <laughs> if uh, if if the discretionary transfer approach does not yield results through the course of next year, then then we may have to begin having that conversation. And I think that's also a part of something like, you know, that could evolve out of a long range facility also. Right, right. Um, thank you for that recommendation and um, thinking through that already. Um, but I have to say, you know, those, those numbers, those comparability numbers are concerning to me. Um, it sounds like they are to you too. Um, and I just, I mean, this is one of those things that I am incredibly passionate about and I am so proud of this district for looking at those numbers and caring about those numbers because um, I, I think they have a huge impact on our schools, um, how our schools perform, but also on our community. Um, I really think they have a direct effect on, on our community. Um, so I thank you for looking at those, um, but I just have to say out loud on record that um, that they, they do concern me. Um, but I'm not recommending or asking for anything because of those, just to keep looking at them. Uh, allow some effort before <laughs> yes. we go down that road. Absolutely. Uh, because Absolutely. that road gets very difficult for the, the yes. entirety of the community. Yes, yes, that does. That's the other effect that it has on the community. <laughs> so thank you. And I would add two quick things. Obviously, I'm not real pleased with those large discrepancies either. And the other thing we've talked about, though, is ways to make sure that that is not having negative impacts on the schools that, you know, with the much higher um, low SES numbers, you know, and, you know, whether that is funding or people or whatever. So, I mean, I know that is also the a way to to tackle that discrepancy, right? So I. I mean, we don't have to get into details here, but I know there's some of that that happens, but maybe there needs to be needs to be more of it with with the bigger gaps. Um, then the other just could you maybe just touch a little bit more on discretionary transfers and just a, defining that just a, a tiny bit more? I mean, would we? 
Yes, ma'am. I, I can de define it specifically. If you are zoned to attend Pecan Trail or Welburn Middle School, and you prefer to transfer to Cyprus or CSMS, the district would approve that transfer. We would not provide transportation. Uh, this is simply an effort to see if we can mitigate the difference between the enrollment numbers uh, and see what impact that might have uh, before we explore um, other avenues. Uh, we would also consider if, if a family was entering fifth grade, for example, and they asked, well, hey, can we be guaranteed this for five and six so they're not transitioning their immediate uh, school year, we'd absolutely consider that so that we're not shuffling kids uh, unnecessarily after a year or, you know, while they're still in intermediate or middle school. It's simply an effort, an informal effort to address those differences in enrollment without creating um, any more disruption that is necessary. Now, we may be sitting here this time next year and the numbers look the same. And if that's the case, then, then we need to start having other conversations. But I think it's well worth the effort uh, before we even consider. How will, besides this conversation right now, how will that communication? We'll communicate it out through the registration process whenever we go down to the elementaries or to the intermediates to register kids for the next school year. Any other questions, comments? I think we're looking for action as well. On this. No, it's just a report. No action. Oh, it's today. not? Oh. No. Nope. All right. Thank you, Ms. Dross. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, brings us to item J4, consider approval of the purchase of 2,000 portable air purification devices and filters for classrooms in the amount of 613,675 from Safeware Inc. through the Omnia Co-op contract, 44000008468, and RFP number 20000002547, utilizing COVID-19 school health support grant funds and ESSER II funds. Mr. Martindale. You missed a zero, but no, that's I okay. Didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, this is requesting approval for the purchase of uh, port portable air purification systems. So this would be uh, one per classroom. Uh, it also articulates the uh, funding source. And with more details uh, on this uh, requested purchase is Ms. Strauss. Thank you. Um, business office is going to be real excited. More COVID funds uh, and the auditors as well. Uh, but the uh, funding source uh, that was made available is uh, through the U.S. Department of Health um, that allocated some of the American Rescue Funds uh, specifically to states uh, for the purpose of, of um, implementing COVID testing programs and to support and maintain our in-person learning. Um, so previously, we got allocated some funds specifically for um, that testing. Um, and now through um, the state's uh, Department of State Health and TEA, uh, they're now designating some more for the in-person learning, um, specifically for um, PPE, cleaning devices, things such as these uh, air filtration systems. Uh, so very specific purposes. Um, but College Station ISD's allocation of these was $526,635, of which we did apply for the full amount. Um, we do have a potential to, um, for some increased funds. Um, so this is strictly an allocation. So some districts may have not applied uh, to receive these nor applied for everything. So in January, um, they will reallocate any funds from districts that uh, did not uh, apply for them to these that did. So there is some potential uh, for some additional funding. Um, but we were um, kind of got cart before the horse. We were anticipating hopefully we would get some funds allocated for this. And so um, we asked um, BLK Architect, along with Salas O'Brien, their mechanical engineers, to help us um, review um, the air filtration machines, portable machines that were out there, because there's many of them. And, and there's, uh, they have 
specifications that vary. And so we asked for their help and they looked at a number of devices and helped us look at trying to find something that would be cost efficient for College Station ISD um, that would meet their requirements. We've specifically said, if we do this, we wanna be able to put them in the classrooms. Uh, so they need to be able to uh, purify the air for this average square footage of a classroom. We wanted to monitor the noise level of them to make sure the decibels would not be um, too high where it's uh, disturbing uh, to the learning environment. So a, a number of things. So they helped us um, and they did this a couple of months ago so that we would be ready should funding become available and, and it did, thankfully. Um, so we felt like of the various uh, reasons you could use these funds, that this would be um, one of the best uses. It not only is a recommendation for um, fighting COVID-19 and uh, helping prevent the spread, but other illnesses such as the flu. So it would be useful beyond uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which we, we hope comes to an end soon, um, but something we can continue to use. Um, so we went out and solicited quotes from various uh, co-ops from four um, different vendors for um, the, the unit, it's called it Medify MA50 that we identified would be uh, the best use and efficient for um, CSISD. Uh, so we got quotes for a total of 2,000 classroom to be used in classroom units and 1,500 replacement filters because we want to make sure as we have to replace those that we can, we'll have a supply of those. Um, Safeware Incorporated uh, provided the lowest bid and could also ensure that we can have these delivered within the time frame required by this grant because it's a pretty um, close window here. Um, but the amount was 613675 So it does exceed um, the grant we got that's specifically for this. Uh, now recall, we may get a little more. Um, but looking at that, we've identified the use of ESSER II funds. That's some other COVID funds that we have not fully budgeted out uh, to pick up whatever balance um, that we have there. So I'm not specific on the amounts, um, but we would use the... Um, funds here first and then once we know our full allocation in January use ESSER two funds for any balance so there would not be any general fund use for this. Um, it's estimated if this is approved um, that they would be here first part of January and we could um, start deploying them. Any questions? So these, these filters need to be replaced once a year? It says six months, but you have to recall ours will not be used all the time. And so it's going to take a little bit of uh, practice to, to determine exactly why. That's why, you know, 1500 uh, should last us a while, but you know, they'll be turned off mostly in the summertime um, and some other times during the year. But it, it looks like every six months they would need to, is what they're saying, but um, we'll have to monitor that. Okay. So as far as a continuing expense, we're looking at 75,000 bucks a year or something? Mean? Potentially, if everything needed to be changed that often. Um, so one of the other things with this particular grant is uh, they would not um, allow us out of this 526,000 um, to purchase a large inventory. You can't stockpile your inventory yet. They want to look at, um, at it would be used in a certain time period. So certainly these, uh, a lot of these filters would be funded with ESSER II funds. Um, and those funds extend out until September 2024, I believe. And like I said, they haven't been budgeted. So once we see that, we should be able to purchase some additional supplies with ESSER II uh, to get the inventory that we need to, to sustain it for a while. Make a motion to approve the funds for the HEPA filters as presented. Machines. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Strauss. 
That brings us to item K1, consider approval of competitive steel proposal as the delivery contract award method for roof repairs, repairs and replacements to spe specified buildings that incurred weather related damage in April of 2021. Mr. Martindale. Thank you. Well, Ms. Strauss is going to bring it home for us. All right. Ms. Strauss. <laughs> I haven't been up here for a while, so I have to <laughs> stay. Um, policy CV local is the policy that um, we have to follow with regard to procurement for construction projects. And, and that also re it adheres to a government code chapter 2269. So uh, two of the things that's required for a construction project um, is that the Board of Trustees must designate an architect or, um, or engineer for the project, and they must designate the procurement method before we go out for um, proposals or, or bids, unless the procurement method is going to be competitive bidding. And competitive bidding is strictly low price. That's it. There's no negotiation. There's no discussion. Um, so we've already done, or you did, uh, designate an engineer for our roofing projects uh, that related to this storm. So that part's been done. Um, we did see an emergency um, temporary patch uh, to keep them from leaking uh, during the spring of last year. So we're now looking at um, roof replacements and trying to get those scheduled. So um, we've kind of looked at all six methods and determined that competitive seal proposal um, would be the best uh, procurement method for these projects. Um, so it's seven specific buildings uh, that this would be uh, authorizing that procurement method, uh, allow us to um, release those requests for proposals um, after this meeting and, and get started. One of the concerns that we have is supplies. Of course, that's uh, everybody's concern. We'd like to certainly try to get some of this done in the summer. Um, so we're asking for your approval to assign competitive seal proposals to the roofing projects, repairs and replacements that were related to the April 2021 storm. And, and any any uh, award of CFP and expenditure of funds would come back through the board for approval. Absolutely. This is simply the contract award. Right. This method. is just the method by which we would um, select, uh, make a recommendation vendor. for a vendor and solicit uh, proposals, quotes, and or bids. Um, we would do competitive seal proposals. Any questions? I'll move that we um, approve using the competitive sealed proposal method for the upcoming um, roof repair. I'll second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Draws. Just stay there. Yep. <laughs> uh, brings us to the last item, K2. Consider approval of the delegation of authority to the superintendent to designate the construction project delivery slash contract award method of either the competitive sealed proposal or job order contracting for the 2020 for the 2021 bond construction and renovation projects. Mr. Martindale. Hear me. Okay. Um, very similar to the last time, so I'll not repeat everything. Um, but in this. Uh, particular item. This relates to the 2021 bond construction projects. Now, realize there are some things in there that are not construction. There's a equipment and, and installations and those things. This is only for the construction projects that are in that bond. Um, and a little bit different here because also in this policy, it does allow the Board of Trustees to delegate its authority under that government code to a, a representative or another person. Um, so a little bit different here. These 2021 projects are not like the roofs. Uh, they vary in size and scope. Um, so competitive seal proposals may not be the right method for them. But in looking at them, there's really two methods out of the six that we think um, most, if not all, of the construction projects would fall under. That being competitive seal proposals, uh, similar to the roofing, but also job order contracting. Um, job order contracting is, is used for smaller kind of repetitive types of uh, projects. Uh, some examples are, are fencing, 
um, concrete work, um, some plumbing or HVAC, th those type things. They're repetitive and smaller in nature. Um, so what we're asking tonight in order to um, expedite our projects, because a lot of these are renovations, so we could get into the timeline. A board meeting just passed, and we decided, oh, this project really needs to come before this one, and then we would have to wait four more weeks to declare that procurement method. Um, so we're asking you tonight to delegate that authority to the superintendent, Mr. Martindale, to um, select either competitive seal proposal or job order contracting for projects within the 2021 bond. If we determine a different procurement method would need for some of the projects, we would bring that back to you um, for discussion and action. Uh, just like the other one, this is not authorizing us to enter into any contract, anything over 50,000. Um, we would bring you uh, the proposals or the job order contract recommendation for your review and action. Um, so it's just basically um, delegating to Mr. Martindale the authority to determine which of these two um, best fits the project for CSISD and we can move forward. Any questions? I move to approve as presented. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Thank Motion you. carries 7-0. Thank you, Ms. Draws. Thank you. And that takes us to the end. Thank you, Mr. Martindale, for this agenda. <laughs> uh, and our gift to the audience is we're not going to exec, so y'all don't need to stay around. So we appreciate y'all being here. We had it easy last month. We are adjourned. <laughs>